Well, welcome to Rare Classic Cars today, and we have a special treat. <laughs> I have my friend, I guess friend, I'll use the term friend loosely, uh -huh. uh, Mark. I thought you meant the car, but yes, anyway. That's yes, that's right, yes, very yes. true. <laughs> so we have, uh, you may have heard Mark in a previous video. Barely, we, barely. Barely, where we reviewed uh, his 1962 Plymouth, and now we have some wireless mics, so. You do, you do. I'm that's just right. a guest here. I'm that's true, guest. yes, you yes. are just a guest. Okay, so today we're doing something pretty unique. Yes. Do you like to use the word unique? I do like to Very use the unique, word unique, pretty yes. unique, and some people have complained about this. So we're going to continue using that just because it's fun. That is very good. So yeah. we have a, we have, I guess, a Chevrolet and a half Chevrolet, right? A sort of a hybrid of its day. A hybrid, yes. 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 So a 59 Impala, which is Mark's, and then the 59 Parisienne, which is mine. So, And there are some similarities between those cars under the skin, which are both extending to the bodies and uh, the suspension systems, which you, I think already talked about in a previous video. I did a little bit. Yeah. Um, and I think so, for those who don't know, both of these vehicles have the Chevrolet chassis, so 119 inch wheelbase, I believe, between both yes. of these. Yes, both of them 119. Which is interesting because the Catalina, which would be the length of this body for the Pontiac, was 122 inch wheelbase. But, and here comes one of the first things we could talk about a little bit, is how they did that, how they did all the different chassis lengths versus the different body shells, which well, is an interesting thing. Let's yeah, we can go into this. Yeah. But first of all, I have to make a little disclaimer. Okay. Just because uh, I have to do that because I actually work at the General Motors Design Center today. And while I have cars like this, and Adam has cars like this, and he used to work at GM, yes. since I still work there, I have to let your viewers know that He's I'm, very biased. I'm very, I'm very <laughs> biased. I'm very biased. No, I'm an equal opportunity collector. As you know, I've got all of them except AMC, which you still have. I do still have. So as far as the American brands go, we both kind of spread it around between Ford, GM, Chrysler, and then you have the AMC to just kind of yes. put the icing on the cake, That's which right. I don't have. So I got you should get one. I should, but which one? Oh, there's anyway, too many good ones. Different, different story, different story. So let's talk about these cars, which are yeah. super interesting from a historical perspective. Why don't you talk about the design of your Impala in the front end, which, I mean, well, all right. Let's okay, take, a, so, take a walk around. So Mark. let's uh, take a look in the front, which we're gonna work our way from the front to the back on these Perfect. cars. And uh, the interesting thing about the 1959 model range, of course, is that they were a total departure for General Motors as a panic response to the 1957 Chrysler uh, models that really set everybody into a, into a tizzy over at the GM Design Center back in the summer of 1956. So these are all new designs that were not planned for 1959. They were disrupting the usual three-year cycle at General Motors. And what's really unique about the panel and the body sharing for Fisher Body is that this was the first time the full-size cars were all on the same platform. So the only difference was what we call the couple, the, the leg room in the back, the floor plan length was varied between the B and the C. Mm. So the B being the Chevrolet, the Junior Pontiacs, and the smaller Oldsmobile. And then the C body was the big Oldsmobile, the Buick, and the Cadillac. And before, there was a distinct B and C body. But from 1959 on, that was no more. They stretched one body, and that was done because they were in such a time crunch to crank out the 1959 all new models across the board. So mm. Fisher Body set an ultimatum and said, we're only gonna do it if we save some time and some resources by building all the cars on the same platform and just stretching it. And they all built all 1959 cars around the Buick front door contour. So between both cars, the skin, all of this, including the little pressings here, the tooling for the front door is completely identical, whether you had a Cadillac, an Oldsmobile, a Chevy, a Pontiac, they're all the Short same. and long wheelbase. Correct? Short and long wheelbase, but there were variants about the door length in both and the B and C body, which is, they had two sets of tooling for the same basic door, basically. Because uh -huh. one was a little longer, because on the C body, the difference was here. They, the C bodies had 100 millimeter or four inches more, so-called couple distance. So they actually gave you a little bit more legroom in the back, and that was the big car, the Cadillac, the big Buick, the big Oldsmobile. And they had to lengthen the mm. identical looking roofs. So on all of these cars, with the exception of the Cadillac limousines and some specialty bodies, some people like these cars. Attention. Yeah, we're attracting it. Who, who doesn't <laughs> with these cars? The glass, the uppers all look the same, even though there's a difference in length between the B and the C. So on the Pontiac, smaller Pontiac, the Junior Olds, the uh, Chevrolet, they had a short roof panel, but the rear glass 
and the front glass and all these little details like the vent wings, they were all identical. So there was really just a difference in the door length and the glass panes in the middle to accommodate the longer couple. They had similar uh, thing with the rear door too, correct? Uh, they, they, I, th I believe they use different appliques. They like use this. different appliques, but as you see here, this is you're referring to the Oldsmobile door with yes. the with the with a patched on tube in the, yes. in the front door. On the Oldsmobile, there was a styling feature that crossed along the spotty side here, and on the front door, because they shared the exact door, they had to make it a separate applique. Mm. Well, on the Pontiac, we have a separate applique on the back door, but I don't know how they shared this door because this feature is unique to the Pontiac. So this couldn't be identical tool. Is it one extra It may have been another step? strike. It may have been a yeah. half tool or an insert. I'm not sure. I have no information on that. I would assume that it was driven by something like that because there was otherwise no reason to do this applique attachment on the Pontiac. Because your Impala has an it's applique. One, it does not have an applique. This oh, is all one okay. smooth stamping on the Impala. Ah, so, okay. And the reason why they could do the wheelbase differences between the different divisions, which supplied unique chassis, so the frames and powertrains, the drive lines, the engines, transmissions, axles, and so forth, were all unique to the engineering of the divisions. They just changed the wheelbase ahead of the front door cut. So there's really no benefit to the wheelbase for interior spaciousness. The only additional benefit could be argued was a slightly better ride if you had a longer wheelbase because it, it improved the uh, stability on the road a little bit. Mm. But there really was no spaciousness advantage to lengthening the wheelbases in those days because you only had two basic bodies, the shorter and the longer couple, and that was it. So another thing that's very interesting about the 59s is, yes, this was the first time I noticed some comments in your, one of your previous videos about, oh, GM badge engineering started back then. No, that was not true. It was always done that way. There was always a shared B body, a shared C body, and so on and so forth. This was just unique in that it was shared across the board for the first time because there was a disruption to the usual three-year renewal cycle. Some of your viewers will definitely know that the 58 Chevrolet was an all-new body. And it was in the marketplace for only one year. That wasn't planned. It was supposed to be in from 58 through 60 because GM's typical Fisher body cycle was three years in those days. But because of the disruption from Chrysler Corporation in 57, they threw out all the plans they had because they looked old. So here we come to the styling of these vehicles. They were really, really futuristic and modern and very different from the cars that preceded them. And of course, the Pontiac is the best styled of the two. You, uh, right? you were you... mentioning that I would be slightly biased earlier, so <laughs> I would like to say that, you know, it goes both ways. So, But the front, the front of the Pontiac, definitely the Frontiac. There we go. Well, this set the theme for the... Exactly. That was so successful that it was a one-year front and only occasionally because split grills and the design studios were kind of bandied about in every studio. Every studio did a variation of a split grill. But Pontiac finally got it for 59. That was an executive decision at the time to give differentiation and distinction. So Pontiac got this theme and it was supposed to be a one year only and for 1960 indeed because the tooling was already underway by the time these came on the market for 1960. They couldn't change back to the split grill. It was so successful that at Pontiac they decided to make this the branded front end design and for 1961 they rece all the Pontiacs including the Little Tempest received the split grill theme, which was initially not planned that way. It just panned out that way because the market was so positive in, in its reception to this front end design. So that became a Pontiac trademark. What's unique about the 59s in terms of overall design and engineering is that this is the first time this and the 59 it's a really you have to include that, where the whole front end is one flat surface. So the whole volume of the front end Everything is designed around the long horizontal plane, which is why I picked this site today architecturally, because it's a mid-century modern building built around the same time with a lot of long horizontal planes. That was the thing in architecture and design is to create these pra almost American prairie style, uniquely American design themes that emphasize the width and, and, and the vast expanses of the I country. I can see that on the Edsel, in spite of yeah. the, uh, the middle circular element of the... There's, uh, funny that you mentioned that. Uh, some of your viewers may know because they've seen the photographs from the design staff in G at GM. There was a proposal of That's a 59 right, with Chevrolet two, uh... with two stacked center <laughs> headlamps, just like the 59 Edsel. Luckily, that didn't come to pass, <laughs> and Ford had to take the, the fall for that one. But uh, between the Edsel and these cars, with the exception of the Cadillac and 
you could say the Buick to a certain extent because it had slanted headlamps. The 59s were the first cars that integrated the headlights into one horizontal element on the front. And that was a very modern face that actually remained valid for the next 30 years. This was a super modern approach. I see to what you're saying. The, the early 50s cars, it was not one plane. They were all still referenced to the separate, the separate fender design. So yes. they all had three volumes. They had the fender, they had a drop in here had a power dome or a hood and the same repeating over here so there was always a strong mm. vertical element and a, and a breakup of the volumes in the front on these the hoods are flat and very sleek and very modern very mid-century modern like the architecture from that time and that was the aesthetically new thing that was the um, the appeal the visual that was giving uh, people at the time the impression this was something from the future and you'll see as we walk around the cars that this whole horizontal long plane theme is, is in everything about these cars. I mean, this was all about width and length and the vast expanses of the country and the optimism of the time and the futurism of the time. So the styling reflected these sentiments. All right, all right let's talk about some of the character of the design here. Well, you have a nice shot of the side of your Pontiac here, of the, the Parisienne. And I think one of the most striking features, and to me, it's one of the best features ever in, uh, in the contemporary car, the contemporary in the sense of 19, late 1950s, early 60s car design, is the famous Vista roof that uh, is one of the most pure and, and one of the most striking expressions of the horizontal plane in the car. And we're getting honked at, you know, these cars make people happy. So I, I tell you, every time I take this thing out of the road, it's like I got like 20 of those experiences. But anyway. So the Vista roof was interesting because everything was supposed to be very light and very floating and almost, almost uh, ephemeral. It was almost supposed to be like a flying saucer whisking at warp speed through the universe. It's sort of sci-fi references. And impossibly thin roof pillars, the massive wraparound glass. This is wrapping around a full 90 degrees here. How do they For, execute that wraparound? I don't know, but like I just drape, heard- Like a drape, over a form? Yeah, well, it's a drape formed glass. And it's safety plate glass too, so there's an additional process to stress the glass and make it safe for impact and so forth. The front uh, glass windshields are laminated on top of that. I heard, and I can't confirm this, but there was talk that the scrap rate was impossibly high for this glass, which is easy to understand when you sense, make that right. in, the, in the plant. But it was a drape formed uh, glass, and uh, you have the original windshield, which also shows a little bit of curvature into the roof, three-dimensional compound curve, which is even more difficult to make. And it can cause variations in the thickness and, and distortions and a few other things that were one of the reasons why these disappeared. The other thing that's interesting is, of course, this was probably the most extreme dog leg. And I think you want to if you ever talked about the ingress and egress of these cars. Um, no. But that was one thing where GM even made an instructional film. They didn't have video in those days, they had film, and a series of photographs with a very graceful uh, young lady uh, wearing a, a dress to show how the modest young lady of today can get into and out no, of these cars gracefully. because it's such a large cutout. Correct. There. It's such a, such a large intrusion into the, the doorway that when you get in, you have to... I'm 6'2", and you're not exactly short either, so we have to duck, right? Yep. Otherwise, you bang your head, and then you have to go derriere first, put the first leg in, and then put the other leg in, minding this corner. Otherwise, you're going to get a nasty encounter with this corner here, the dog leg bumping your knee, which is one of those things that people did not like, obviously, and the ingress and egress, getting in and out of these things, was so uncomfortable, and the fact that they even put out instructions on how to get in and out tells you a story. Well, it's a very legs out seating position too. Very quite low. big because look how low these are. If you go back, let's walk over to the Chevy. Just take a little, take in the, uh, the length and the lowness of the roof. The Chevy is even, because it has the two-tone, it's even emphasizing the lightness of the upper a little bit more. But um, there is basically less than a foot of gas here. It's only about a Half inches of glass in the in the side and these vehicles overall are less than 54 inches tall so they have the height of a sports car and that's also where they get the, this roof style gets its name from on Chevrolets they were called the sports sedans and at first I thought there's nothing sporty about these cars why are they called <laughs> sports sedans 
but it is really uh, probably referring to the getting in and out of it. It's actually referring to the lower roof line. The sports models were the convertibles, the two-door coupes, the pillarless coupes or the hardtop coupes, and the four-door hardtop sedans, and they were called the sports models. They were two inches lower than the sedans, the mm. regular sedans, which had the posts, the center pillars, and the taller glass that were a little less sporty in proportion. Great interior fabric. So the 59 is a wonderful interior as well as an exterior. Maybe we should walk to the back of the car. And yeah, let's talk a little more about the Do the pièce de résistance on the 59 Chevrolet, which of course, that is what has burnt it into the collective memory of people worldwide. Even I grew up in Germany and even we knew about this car when I was a kid, the crazy Batwing, uh, Gullwing Chevrolet. This was probably the most daring and most extreme body stamping ever attempted on a, on a mass production car. If you look at this, this is almost a foot deep here. This is probably 280, 300 millimeters of How is of draw that manufactured? Depth. Is that? Uh, very, with great difficulty, I should imagine. <laughs> and it's also seamed here. There is a wonderful uh, scene from a photographer or a film crew who was filming at the Chevrolet plant, one of the Fisher plants in 1958-59 when they were building these, and you see them going through the metal shop, and you see one of the metal shop workers with a big oh, soldering right, yeah. iron going through there and putting filler in these seams here. If you go underneath here, you'll see it. They only filled it to eye level. Oh my goodness. There you go. No there is idea. the little body seam that's totally filled, and it did a nice job on this particular one. You don't see any roughness here. But the, and the other side has a different cutoff point because they were manually done, so each operator on each side I had did no a different idea. one. See, it, it, has a higher, it has a higher cutoff point here because somebody soldered it. They were supposed to be soldered to sort of eye level and then good enough. You know, that's how they were built. Wow. So it's a crazy body work on this car. Um, enormous trunk but a relatively high lift over. Uh, the 59 Pontiac was a little better for that. Um, the uh, rear glass here is really, really beautiful in, in conjunction with these forms. And you do have the 58 Impala little faux yes, vent Yes, the faux vent. This was faux. It was a totally simulated uh, pot metal fake air vent. And in 1960, it walked down to this part here, but it was a part of the 58 Impala themed air scoops and jet scoops and all this stuff. It took another almost 10 years before flow through ventilation became a thing. I think you said that you did a 71, video about that. Yeah. yeah. Well, they yeah. had the Astro ventilation a little bit earlier. Well, the European cars were having these, these systems already in the late 50s, like the Mercedes-Benz Fintail cars, uh, the, the more upscale ones that received a standard flow through. Some of the French cars started to have it around that time. But in American cars, it was because of the additional cost and the additional engineering. And most people in America that were the lower speeds that, are, that were driven in, in the US as compared to Europe, uh, there wasn't as much need for closed car windows up ventilation. Mm -hmm. And people usually roll the windows down if they smoked a lot, that sort of thing. But it was coming and this sort of anticipated that, uh, that flow through ventilation system that came in the 64 Thunderbird, I believe, was the first American car that had it standard. You also have the one-piece bumper as opposed to the three-piece. Yeah, funny that you mentioned that. There, there are, I think it might have been driven by insurance regulations or something, but some of the 59 GM or Chevys have seams here and they have three-piece bumpers. They have the seams in these corners and some of the other cars from California or some other places where it wasn't required by the insurance regulations, I assume, had the smoother, cleaner one-piece, which this car has. It's great, great back end. And the two-tone, I think, is uh, definitely helps visually. Yeah, too. this car did probably not come with a two-tone. I have no history. I've had this car for many years. But if you got the two-tone, you normally would have a piece of stainless that would cover the brake. And don't uh, go in too closely. It's a, it, this car is a 40-footer. <laughs> the paintwork is not very good. But it's, it's a nice daily driver. I've had it for so long. This headliner is interesting because it's, uh, it looks like it sparkles. But it really is just a rotated waffle pattern embossing. Rotated so it, waffle it, It's a pattern. waffle pattern, a little little hexagonal ridged, yeah. like ruffles, wow. like the like the ruffles uh, Mine potato is much chips. simpler. And yes. Vinyl. Yes, Yours is yes. cloth, right? No, this is vinyl. That's vinyl. Okay. Cloth was only in the non-sports uh, models, in the sedans, Bel Airs, and Biscaynes. Um, the Impala was the luxury trim. So it has a very jazzy interior, including a very sparkly headliner. Uh, Pontiac had the um, sparkles in the headliner with the little mylar stars and yes. the little flecking. And Chevrolet did something similar, but with the embossing. You can and see. You see very colorful interior themes in both cars. Yours is a gray tone and tone, but it's still extremely 
lively and, and, and just very colorful and, and fun because of all the beautiful little mylar details. Another thing that's interesting on these cars is they wanted chrome on everything, so these strips are mylar, and as you can see, they all peel off, yeah. right? <laughs> well, on the Chevrolet Impala, they put mylar strips in the seats. You can imagine how long those lasted. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, so this was a this was a milestone design in 59. It set the tone for a lot of design to come, but it was very extreme. So if we go to the back of the Pontiac. Yeah, what are your thoughts on the back of the Pontiac? It's a here? beautiful rear end design. Uh, it has some it has some details that are not as mature as on the Chevy because if you look at the way the little rabbit tips are are pressed into the form. I thought those were cat's ears. Whatever you want to call them, <laughs> but the things, the things it has. Yeah. They're maybe, they, they didn't quite know how to resolve the shapes. The 59 Chevy, no matter what you think about the general statement, some people are very put off by this extreme gullwing design. But on this car, it was much more muted and it was a much more architectural form. The simple oval very, very attractive. And on the in the U.S., they had the big, old, yeah. the big old tail lamp cluster, which was even more attractive to my, to my eye. But the very nice composition of these actually very simple and tasteful forms where you have this concave uh, panel here. You've got a very logical and resolved bumper. And then you've got the little rabbit, in the, the, these little ends here that referred an earlier time. They, they're a little bit more like the mid-50s. And that's the theme for the whole 59 Pontiac. They were super modern in the front end, the whole body and the Why whole Why do you character. say that refers to the mid-50s there? Because these, these look, look at the 55, 56 Fords and their fins. Ah, and okay. the round tail lamps. This is sort of a form language that actually, actually was a little passe by the time 1959 came around. And then you look at the side, and where the Chevrolet has a very simple one piece, very long, horizontal, uninterrupted piece with a little color insert in the back and oblique or italic uh, lettering for the Impala. This car has more of a mid 50s philosophy when it comes to the body side uh, trim because that sweep spear design that harkens back to like the Buicks and, and the right. Oldsmobiles of the mid, uh, mid 50s. And then it has these hash marks which also have some kind of big vent ports on the sides, portholes. And uh, they were more ornamental and more decorative without necessarily referring to any meaningful function. On the Chevy, it was simpler and it was placed right in the middle of the body curvature where it actually could serve the function of a rub strip a little bit. It could protect you from door dings uh. a little bit. So it has a bit more of a functional character, although of course it was pure decoration uh, because instead of getting door dings on the paint, you got door dings on your stainless steel trim. So it's not <laughs> like it was giving you it's interesting you mentioned this concave. I, I mean, I've seen it, but I've never really thought about it. And it kind of reminds me of the, what is it, the early 2000s Intrepid or the current Cherokee. Yes. You know, yes. they have that concave. Yes, yeah, so concave elements on cars are interesting because having it, something that has a concavity in it can, can create a very nice, nice uh, uh, contrast and nice tension in the surface. But it's difficult to handle on larger surfaces because it makes the surface look weak if it's too big. So concave surfaces are always a good accent, but they're never a good idea as a primary theme, uh, which is sort of where the 59 Chevy is sort of on the cusp. But because it's so extreme, the way the fins are handled, it is so extreme, it yeah. doesn't even read as a concave. It reads as a separate sort of tailplane blade, like a wing of an aircraft that emerges. And it's, very, it's actually very subtly modeled. If you look at the, uh, it's actually very subtle, very elegant start of the shape and then it, it becomes deeper and deeper, almost impossibly deep and until you got a foot of overhang, which is interesting because these things would bang into eaves and overhangs and, and uh, awnings when you were pulling up next to a curb and the road had any camber. You know, like in New York City where you would have like a little breezeway or something or canopy yes. at a restaurant or something and the car canted to the side and people were getting out of a taxi cab. These had a tendency oh. to bang into whatever was like, like a mailbox or whatever was on the side of the curb. <laughs> that is such an extreme uh, yeah. feature of the car. It's very, very extreme and it's very either you love it or you hate it. I happen to love it. To me, it's one of the most wonderfully bold expressions of, of motion sculpture on an automobile um, and they just did it so beautifully if you look at the little subtle 
the proportion of the upper and lower teardrop shape, the way they proportion the tail lamps, and the way it's sculpted in, and the way it blends out, and then the deep inset license plate coat, which is another reference to the 57 Chrysler cars. That's true. I never noticed yeah, that. It's like a, it's yeah. it's rotated very, forward yep. as very well. Very three-dimensional and very, very... Um, it's not an afterthought. It's part of the... It sets up the entire back end of the car. And by 1959 standards, even though to today's eyes it has a ton of chrome and bright work on it. Most of it, by the way, was stainless steel or anodized aluminum, so there's not much polishing to it. And the only pop metal is the bumpers and a couple of the accent pieces like the fake vent and so forth. But it was actually a very restrained car when it came to bright work and chrome in 1959. We laugh about this now, statements, but <laughs> it was when you compare to what went before. Which is one of the reasons why they changed, because by 1958 they'd gone off the rails so much with the overabundance of bright work and completely meaningless decoration on those cars that uh, even the public was starting to make fun of it. Most notably, uh, Mr. Romney from AMC, who was caricaturing those, uh, you know, spoofing uh, those cars as a gas-guzzling dinosaur. Boy, the 58 Buick and Olds, like the correct. top line ones, yes. They had but so Ford much. made fun of this one in a brochure. They had a little cartoon of a, of a little girl running away from the garage and screaming, Mommy, Mommy, something's eating my bicycle. <laughs> so uh, this, this certainly uh, made some eyeballs pop in 59. And today you can't even describe. I love the reverse lights way down at the bottom. Yeah, right? they're, they're way down. They were an add-on. They were optional. They were standard only on the Impala. And the other cars had to, uh, had to get that sec uh, extra. There is um, a metal piece that's divided by these little bumper tips here. These little... And oh, they so came three with piece, yeah. yeah, it's three piece. So it came with or without holes for the backup lights. So that's one Got of those it. things uh, where you make you know piecemeal make a puzzle piece off the body shapes. What is the function of the dual antennas? Well, that was a popular accessory. This car originally did not come with those, but I bought it like this. Many collectors of these cars order them. They were available. This was an accessory that was available back in the in the fifties. It's just, um, I mean, I guess better reception. I have an original radio, this has an aftermarket one in it, and I have an original radio that I need to have retrofitted with Bluetooth so I can do the sound system properly in this car without you know, looking unoriginal. Um, this was a popular accessory, it looked a little more sleek, and uh, one of them was dead, it was just a dummy. Oh, okay. So the wiring, this one is wired, but only to one side. I see. And normally it was on the right front fender. Was one a dummy in, in the... I think so, because okay. there was no stereo and it was all That's AM right. at the time. That's right, it was time, just non-oral so, AM. Yeah, so I don't think there was any, any other purpose to that than styling. And contrary to your car, I have dual mirrors, but that again could have been... I mean, I know that both of them have been replaced by aftermarket pieces, so it may have been not even original equipment on this car. Is this the Mylar you were referencing? Yes, like? so this is now gone here. As you see, the Mylar from here and from here has all disappeared. That's very typical of these. It lasted about three weeks and then it started <laughs> peeling off. Which there's is a little, there's, a it's still idea. on the back there, I guess. Yeah, but it's starting to peel, as you can see, occasionally when I have passengers in the car, which I do, you see how it peels. But um, very nice door trim panels. The door cards are very, very iconic. This is a styling theme and motif that was used. To this day, we use this actually in many cars. This sort of boomerang shape, it's very dynamic. You're right. The sport models have this beautifully elongated arm length. It's a sport sports arm length, a luxury arm uh, armrest. With this, GM used this by the millions. Yeah, for many years. Beautiful, for many years. My Riviera well, has that. Into the late 60s. 60s. Yeah. The Opel Diplomat in Germany had it, and wow. uh, this was something that GM would reuse over and over again, the hardware, because it's beautifully styled and because of the enormous volume they had, they probably, this expensive to make part probably came down to a pretty reasonable cost, but you wouldn't know more about that because you're a finance guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a great walk around. Any final thoughts, Mark, on pretty iconic well, I era mean, for the auto it's, design? to me amazing that cars that are basically the same and in this case the narrow track Pontiac with the Chevrolet chassis the 59 Chevrolet chassis as you can see here another interesting styling uh, result uh, of this narrow chassis on the Pontiac is it looks even more narrow track than the Chevrolet it does with the bumper flaring yeah, outward fender and the bumper so you have this blade surface that instead of tucking under like on the Chevrolet where it's very rounded and completes the volume and it doesn't make the narrow track seem so out of place, 
on the Pontiac, it accentuates the very narrow track. <laughs> so it makes it look, even, especially in the back, it makes it look even more underwheeled yes, and, and overbodied. I love if I stand about here, it's, it, it appears the car is floating in the rear. Right, You can't right. see the rear wheel. Exactly. Well, that was also another motif. I mean, today we have different standards. Everything is very muscular. Everything is very aggressive, very track-like. Proportions today have to be extremely stout and very much wheel-oriented. In the 1950s, they were trying to get rid of the wheel orientation, make the car seem like flying saucers, because that was sort of the, the trend of the era, was sure. to pretend the cars were floating, like anti-gravity levitation or <laughs> something like that. And if you drove fast enough over a bumpy road, you probably started <laughs> to uh, levitate with these cars. Funny oh. little um, story on this car. This particular car was used for a little Mythbuster story in Motor Trend Classic about 15 years ago where we had, um, we put this in the GM wind tunnel uh, when we had uh, uh, some time open to do a little fun PR thing. Uh, we had a cancellation for um, a reserve time, so I used to work with the aerodynamics group in the, in the GM design center, uh, you know, designing cars around aero requirements in the wind tunnel with clay models and so forth. And I got pretty uh, chummy with some of the people there and we decided this would be fun to do. So. We uh, put this thing in the wind tunnel and uh, Motor Trend, uh, Frank Marcus from Motor Trend Classic and GM Communications got involved and we uh, tried to run a few tests to disprove one of the popular urban myths of the time, which was that these fins made the car lift off at speed. That's, that rumor circulated even in the 1950s when that car came out. Mm. And we put that one to rest completely because actually there's downforce in the back and uh, there's a lot of lift, but it's all in the front. And these cars did not lift off at speed. That was uh, that was bogus. But people like to make up these things even back then. So, <laughs> and it looks like it might lift off. It does. Yeah. Well, that was a great overview. So, so we're going to talk a little bit about the interior. Why don't Mark? Why don't you discuss some? Of well, the I mean, this features. is something that's probably near and dear to your heart because we can talk a little bit about where the money went or where it didn't go. They spent so too much money on both of them. They spent too much money yeah, on both of them, didn't all, they? Yes. That's right, yeah. Well, actually, on this one... I well, they sold 400 and some thousand of these Impalas. So that they was... sold well over half a million of the Impalas oh, in 1959. Okay. They made 1.48 million cars altogether in 1959, which was a little bit ahead of Ford, but Ford almost had them beat. That's across the Biscayne, the Impala. It, but yeah. all, all the full-size cars was almost 1.5 million, which is inconceivable today when you think about it, but uh, amazing. And the Impala was the luxury trim, of course, so it has more jazzy, snazzy interior features. But I happen to know from the now, unfortunately, late designer of this car, Blaine Jenkins, whom we can dedicate a whole other segment to if you want to talk about the sure. old Regencies. But he told me, because he worked on this interior, that he had carpeting planned and, and lighting uh, active reflectors and light down here and the impala was basically even th even the impala was thrifted in those days so this is just kind of a dielectric uh, mylar application or, or or vinyl application and again we already talked about the mylar strips that weren't real metal and they like to peel off and it did have the hardware that was common at, at gm at the time across the board but if you look at the bottom there's no carpeting the kick the kick area it's all warped on these and, and it's very susceptible to uh, toe kicks and, and there's nothing to protect it. So they just put a little shiny uh, <laughs> silver strip on it. If you go over to your Pontiac, you see where the money went there. Because that's a much more complex door panel, equally fun in design and very lively. It's the same basic door card, but it has many more layers to, you know, you get more embossings here. You've got these bright pieces that are appliques. You have a more elaborate armrest, even with mylar applications that come off. But there's actually a, a more elaborate uh, scheme of layering here going with some real metal accents. This is some real uh, stainless accent. There are some textured um, uh, metallic effect uh, vinyl here. And look at the hardware on the door lower. So you can already see that this door trim is actually more expensive to make. And it has some sewn features. There's some real stitches here in this vinyl applique, which on the Impala is just a, a heat melt. Vacuum form or whatever. Well, it's, it's a dielectric. It's, it's basically pressed in a, with hot wires and a die, so it's a much cheaper process. You don't have to sew anything. Whereas this is an actual cut and sew piece that's put on there. So that's where you see where the money is. The same with the seats. They have additional pleating and inserts and piping. So they're a little bit more elaborate. And on the Chevrolet, they tried to make up for that by, by making it very colorful and very jazzy, although this isn't exactly tame on the inside either. And an interesting thing is that the Pontiac feels much more spacious, even though it has the same interior dimensions. And that's usually 
just a result, not usually, it's, here it is definitely the result of the instrument panel being pushed way further forward than on the Chevy. Mm. So the, uh, the top pad of the instrument panel is much shorter. If you go over to the Chevrolet, you see that it comes way further rearward in car. It's reminiscent of the 58 Corvette uh, uh. Uh, styling theme, which is actually a very lovely motif on Especially this Especially on the passenger compartment. Correct. Too. And on a Corvette, this was actually carved out, and later on they added a grab bar here. But on the Chevy, it was just stamped metal. And it comes back by about three to four inches further into the cabin. So even though they have the same interior dimensions, mm. it feels less spacious a little bit in the Chevy because the instrument panel and the knee bolts are knee bolts, so the lower of the instrument panel where the glove boxes and everything comes further rearward in car. And so subjectively, the Chevy does feel like a slightly smaller car, even though it isn't. That's interesting because the the driver's pod and, like you said, this passenger area are kind of in the same plane. Yes. Whereas in the Pontiac, correct. It's, yes. It's almost like a carve out. Very different interior theme. The Chevrolet has the tried and true split uh, or dual cowl motif, which is a symmetrical theme. The Pontiac has a driver orient driver oriented cockpit with that binnacle in front of the driver. A very rich instrument panel, by the way. A lot of bright work. A lot of expensive pot metal pieces that have been plated. So this is definitely more upscale. And then the additional grab handle, which became a Pontiac feature on the Bonnevilles anyway. And the Grand Prix, I believe, had a two later. That's right, for many years. Into for the, many years. Into the uh, much more expensive. There are just more parts and there's more quality parts on this. Which is how you differentiated the, the, and justified the different pricing, right? While the basic car was the same especially on the Canadian version with the Chevrolet chassis. Underneath. That's right. Yeah. You're absolutely right. But this, uh, this Bonneville interior is just stunning. I'm always just fascinated looking at it, how, how intricate it is and how elegant it is. It's, it's very nicely done. A lot of different fabrics too. A lot of different fabrics. So that's another thing. Instead of just one fabric with a vinyl side bowl, so you have inserts, you have uh, different textures, you have all kinds of things that are very pleasing to the senses and uh, that give that car a more upscale character than the Impala. All of the Impala was so much fun through the bold motif and the, and the pretty expressive colors that it's hard to not keep your eye peeled on the various crazy interior motifs on that car. Yeah, you really don't have a side, you have one kind of big stitch that goes for the whole No, this is a much simpler design. It's a single piece insert. It's a big downgrade from the 58 Impala, which was actually a luxury trim as part of the Bel Air series. And the 58 Impala has a much more elaborate interior trim uh, approach that was more expensive to make. They costed all of that out. 1959 was the first year the Impala was officially the top line series and the Bel Air was relegated to the mid-range series. Whereas in 1958, the Bel Air was at the top of the line with the Impala being a sub-series to the Bel Air. But ironically, in 58, the body of the Impala is completely different from the Bel Air. It has different exterior panels except for the front mm. end. Uh, the roof line is lower and the body side stampings on the rear end are totally different on the 58 um, Impala versus the Bel Air. Interesting. And this is a very handsome interpretation of the Corvette uh, interior. They tried to get interesting too that Many GM cars of that period didn't have the horizontal speedometer. They had round, round gauges, which is usually a cue for sportiness. The light weighting with a perforate, the whole pattern in the, uh, in the steering wheel was a, was a racing cue, which sort of, <laughs> well, you laugh about it, but I think that was the, uh, not I think, Blaine Jenkins told me that was the motif for the steering wheel, is to wow. give you a more sporty appearance through having the whole pattern in the spokes of the steering wheel. A very popular feature was the two-toning of the of the rim, which in this car is so used and worn it's peeling off. So, <laughs> <laughs> have that repainted at one point. But uh, everything about the Impala, especially, was about fleetness and sleekness and speed. So the styling has a lot of go fasters, what we like to call go fasters, on the on the interior as well as the exterior. Whereas the Pontiac is more architectural. It's, um, it's very sleek, the front end with a split grille and the V emblem, the Pontiac. Uh, dripping down the uh, front dripping of down the, the front. That's gorgeous. That's, that's a perfect go faster, this one here. You know, where you have something with a very sharp needle point that flows back like a streak, like a condensation trail of an aircraft. And on the Chevy, you have two rocket forms. 
similar to the Pontiac, which is smaller on the Pontiac, curiously enough, but on the Chevy, you have the streak going all the way back, at least on the Impala trim. Oh, that's true. Yeah, this is a contray. Look at this, it's a little rocket or, or delta wing. This one only plane. goes back a little bit. Correct, this one only, it stops about a foot uh, back, and this one goes all the way to the base of the windshield. But these were optional trim pieces, not on the Impala, but on the other, other cars. This is what spruced up the Impala, but they're all go fasters, right? They're all designed to accentuate sleekness and speed and length, including the overhang, sure. which is unique to the roof style. I don't think we talked about this earlier. It's actually very practical because not only is it a nice visual element, it sort of creates a little contrail uh, extension, but it's actually quite practical from a uh, sudden load point of view. When you sit in the back of this car, mm. you weren't baked, you weren't, you weren't roasted like you were in the two-door coupes. The two-door coupes you sat under the glass. That's and right. You were, you were roasting. On these, it's actually Especially nice and cool. Especially with non-tinted glass. Correct. Uh, but these were, I think, these were always tinted. Mm. The sports. I'm not sure. There could could be an optional extra. Um, but uh, that's another interesting feature about the Vista roof is that it overhangs a little bit and creates some shaded area. All right. And of course, we know that the visibility in these is amazing. That it is. is. Which is, uh, even though these cars. We know latest since that infamous 2009 offset crash <laughs> test with the Chevy Malibu that the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety conducted with this car, mind you. Yeah. I'm still kind of sore about that one. To prove that 50-year-old cars are unsafe, well, great. We didn't know that, did we now? <laughs> um, but um, the fact that you can actually see what's coming at you before it comes to you right. is, is a safety factor we are Well, and you have no blind spot, today. really. No blind spots. If you have a blind spot here, you are blind. <laughs> There's just no way that you have a blind spot in this car. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Mark. Okay, well, I want to just thank Mark. Uh, it's certainly great to have a different voice from the finance person's voice that you normally hear and have a true design perspective. <laughs> and I admit as a finance person that, you know, Excel spreadsheets are never all that beautiful, but I think it's a great treat to hear from somebody who's a design expert talk about the I car wish era. I could have been around back in the 50s when this was done because quite frankly these cars when I was a little kid these were the kinds of cars that made me want to become a car designer so I don't know if that's actually beneficial today but <laughs> <laughs> but I'm enjoying it tremendously and I mean your car is such a rarity it's such a beautiful original example and has such a rich sort of value just from being original it's not never been tinkered with I'm, i every time i see it it makes me happy just to see it out on the road this one i've put over sixty thousand miles on in the course of well good for 15 you 15 plus They're years so enjoyed and driven and <laughs> yeah this is not a low mileage original i think i've clocked the odometer once and i don't know how many times it was turned over before so <laughs> we don't that's know. part of the fun yes but it has the original power okay. another one like with uh, just like it but it has a four barrel so that one had the 210 or 230 yeah. HP gross horsepower. That's right. It was like 180, right. 230. I think fuel injection. And then you could was get the 348, the, right. the big truck-based mill that uh, that often came with an absolutely unsuitable turbo guide transmission that liked to blow up behind the giant torque of the, the 348. Stay tuned for a video on that, by the way. I actually oh, have yeah. some of the original engineering documents for the turbo glide. Oh, the turbo glide. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mark. It was a great yeah. treat. It was a great pleasure. Thanks well, for watching. Time. Take care. Let us know what you think.